On 14th June 1297, a writ was sent to the faithful subjects of Edward I, King of England, in his realm of Scotland. They were ordered to assist John, Earl Warren, the keeper of the King's land and realm of Scotland, who had been sent to those parts, quote, to repress the rebel rebellion and malice of certain rebels, malefactors and disturbers of our peace. The order was occasioned by a growing conflict in Scotland following William Wallace's killing of the Sheriff of Lanark early in May. And this appears to be the first time that Edward, or his government, referred to Scots who had risen in arms against him as rebels. From Edward's point of view, this was a simple statement of fact. Acting as lawful overlord of the Kingdom of Scotland, he had deposed John Balliol, King of Scots, and taken upon himself the Lordship of Scotland, after Balliol had egregiously failed to fulfil his lawful obligations and made alliance with Edward's enemies. The Scots were therefore now Edward's immediate subjects, and so their armed resistance to him was rebellion. Equally though, the description of Scots who opposed Edward's rule as rebels was a deliberate attempt to influence political opinion, intended to shape perceptions of Edward's military campaigns by framing them as a just war. This position was expounded at length in a formal statement to Pope Boniface VIII in 1301, replying to Boniface's bull of 1299, which had required Edward to cease his war. And Edward said, and since we are acknowledged to be in possession of that realm, i.e. Scotland, by right of full dominion, we cannot, and indeed must not, fail to repress the insolence of our rebel subjects, whoever we should find them, by our royal preeminence, so far as shall be just and as we shall see fit. A similar message was also addressed to an internal English audience. In the febrile political atmosphere in England in the summer of 1297, the obligation of military service was becoming increasingly controversial. And so, writs relating to the Scottish wars began to include clauses denouncing the Scots as wicked rebels, as a means of justifying the demands that were being made of Edward's subjects, and so attempting to head off opposition to those demands. For instance, the feudal summons to the Royal Expedition to Scotland of 1300 was justified as being necessary, quote, for the safekeeping of our royal crown and the common good of the magnates and nobles and the benefits of the whole people of our kingdom and also for preventing the damages, scandals and perils which may arise from the rebellion of the Scots, our enemies and rebels, if it were to be endured any longer. Describing Edward's Scottish opponents as rebels who threatened the good order of the realm emphasised the challenge he represented to his authority, framing them as internal opponents of his just rule. It was therefore harder for Edward's English subjects to justify refusing to serve against them than if they had been presented as a foreign sovereign enemy. Especially as, when Edward first disposed this line in the summer of 1297, the Scots had not invaded England since the Civil War of 1216 to 17 and so they could hardly be painted as a major threat. The same line was taken following Robert Bruce's seizure of the Scottish kingship in 1306. From Edward's viewpoint, coming after the sacrilegious murder of John Comyn, Edward's subject, this was a clear act of rebellion. The expeditions he subsequently mounted against Bruce therefore constituted a just war against traitorous rebels. This message was reinforced by the treatment of a number of Scottish lords who were captured under arms. Rather than being ransomed, they were executed for treason. Edward II took a similar line, steadfastly refusing to recognise Bruce's kingship. Royal writs consistently refer referred to Bruce simply as Robert de Bruce, denying him even his title of Earl of Carrick although there were no executions of Scots during the end of the Second Reign, because his dire record of military failure ensured that there were no Scottish prisoners to be executed. He stuck to this line even after the sealing of the 13-year truce in 1323, which effectively ended Anglo-Scottish conflict for the rest of his reign. His letters patent uh, proclaiming this truce studiously referred to 
Sir Robert de Bruce. Similarly, throughout Edward II's reign, royal writs routinely, if not with the same consistency, referred to the Scots as rebels. The tone was set by a writ of August 1307, granting to Aymer de Valence, shortly to be appointed Edward's lieutenant in Scotland, the authority to receive into the King's faith, quote, all those of Scotland who are still our rebels and in our enmity. Again, references to the Scots as rebels continued even following the sealing of the truce of 1323. <coughs> Excuse me. Edward III's government initially took a different line, framing requests for service in terms of defending the realm against the malice of the Scots, right, or the hostile attacks of the Scots. Nevertheless, by the end of June 1327, the Crown had reverted to referring to Scots as Edward's enemies and rebels. This policy was necessarily overturned with the sealing of the Treaty of Northampton in March 1328, a peace agreement which entailed the recognition of Robert Bruce as King of Scotland in full sovereignty. The Scots could therefore no longer be considered as rebels, or indeed even enemies, of the King of England. The situation became somewhat more complicated in 1332, however, when Edward Balliol, John Balliol's son, seized the Scottish kingship at the head of a faction of dispossessed English Anglo-Scottish magnates known as the Disinherited. The following year, Edward III invaded Scotland to reinstall Balliol following his ousting by supporters of David II, Robert Bruce's son and successor. Writs of the English crown now again began to refer to the Scots are enemies and rebels. And this, notwithstanding the fact that Edward Balliol had performed homage to Edward III of the Kingdom of Scotland as the price for the latter's support. Such references continued throughout the 1330s, tailing off somewhat towards the end of the decade, though odd references continued to appear in desultory fashion until 1347, ceasing thereafter, apart from a brief flurry in 1355 to 6 when the Scots captured Berwick in breach of the truce. <coughs> this followed on the decision to ransom David II after his capture at Neville's Cross in 1346, which amounted to a de facto recognition of his kingship. Although even then, Edward III could not bring himself to actually acknowledge David's title until the Treaty of Berwick of 1357. And when Robert II succeeded David in 1371, Edward could only refer to him as our cousin of Scotland. Although he was, however reluctantly, willing to concede that documents addressed to Robert thus, quote, shall have the same validity as if our cousin had indeed been named in the same letters as King of Scotland. The Crown's framing of its Scottish enemies as rebels will, of course, be familiar from the work of historians such as Michael Presswich and Matthew Strickland. But it is worth considering the impact of the Crown's efforts to disseminate this political and diplomatic agenda. There have been a number of studies of the use of political communications in late medieval England, usually characterising them as propaganda. But the actual effectiveness of such political communication has not received the same attention. And incidentally, I preferred to avoid the use of the term propaganda in this paper uh, due to the weight of conceptual baggage which it has become attached to it. Uh, and I do wonder if it carries rather too many anachronistic associations to be a useful concept for the study of late medieval England. But that's something I'll be very happy to discuss further in the questions. In this case, uh, for some four decades on and off, the Crown have pushed the line that Robert and David Bruce should not be recognised as kings and that the Scots were rebels, with some considerable effort if not always with much inconsistency. And yet, it would appear, sorry, uh, would appear that these efforts had only a limited impact on English perceptions of the status of the Scots and their kings. From the point of view of the kings of England, and especially of their advisers, men who are steeped in political and legal theory on issues of kingship, sovereignty, and lordship, their wars against the Scots had to be legitimized in legal terms as just wars. Contemporary doctrine held that a war of aggression was sinful and the act of a tyrant, leading to the unnecessary spilling of Christian blood. War 
could only be justified if waged by a sovereign prince and only in order to cover property, i.e. lands, rights or claims of which they had been wrongfully deprived. The wars in Scotland had to be framed as just wars to a variety of diverse audiences, such as the papacy, as when Edward I rebutted Boniface VIII's Bull of 1299, as we've seen, the Counts of Flanders, as when in 1333, Edward III requested Count Louis of Flanders to prohibit his subjects from giving aid to the Scots, or the Gaelic Lords of Ireland, as when Edward II requested some 25 of them to send contingents of men for his ill-fated expedition of 1314. And these justifications and the languages in which they and the language in which they were presented to these diverse audiences were generally similar, albeit tailored to their particular recipients. Although it's worth noting this was not invariably the case. When Edward I, for instance, requested the church for prayers on behalf of his wars, he tended to emphasize the moral rather than the political issues, stressing the wickedness and malice of the Scots and their plundering of churches rather than their rebelliousness. The Crown also, and perhaps most importantly, had to justify its wars to the community of the realm of England which comprised primarily those who wielded political influence, the nobility, the gentry, the higher clergy and the oligarchies of the towns. It was they, after all, who authorised the taxes and raised the troops to fight these wars. And as a political crisis over Edward I's Flanders expedition of 1297 had made all too clear, taxes and troops would only be forthcoming if these groups were persuaded that the king's demands were reasonable. Thus, royal demands for taxes and troops were couched in terms which included these same justifications. It is, of course, notoriously difficult to gauge public opinion, or rather the opinions of what might be termed the political classes in the, uh, in the Middle Ages even in such a comparatively well-documented polity as late medieval England. There are, for instance, no surviving 14th century letter collections to compare with the political gossip recorded in the past in letters. And there are few surviving records which shed light on speeches and debates in English parliaments in the first half of the 14th century. However, some indication of contemporary English views on Scotland's relationship to England may be found reflected in chronicles. Their authors, whether monks or secular clerks, would have been amongst the intended audience for the Crown's political communications. <coughs> for the church was required to pay taxes for the king's wars, while many religious corporations were major landowners and so owed obligations to raise men for the king's armies. An example of such messaging, directed to the church, comes from the Lincoln Parliament of 1327, when William, Mel William Melton, Archbishop of York, wrote to Louis de Beaumont, Bishop of Durham, to inform him that the northern province was required to contribute to a tax. Milton quoted the royal justification for this demand based on the need to defend the realm, and citing the siege of Norham Castle by, quote, Sir Robert Bruce with a great army of Scots, the king's rebels and enemies. And of course, in fact, uh, Beaumont would have been all too aware of this situation as he actually held Norham Castle as a Bishop of Durham. A representative example of the reception of such crown messaging is provided by the account of Edward II's reign in the Chronicle of, York, of the Yorkshire Augustinian uh, Priory of Bridlington. In his first mention of Bruce, relating to the capture of Roxburgh and Edinburgh in 1313, the chronicler denies Bruce his royal title, describing him as quote, bearing himself as King of Scotland. However, the same chronicler does accord Bruce's title when he describes the Battle of Bannockburn as being fought between, quote, the King of England and Robert Bruce, King of Scotland. Thereafter, he veers between both descriptions. Though it is notable that when describing various parties' negotiations with Bruce, including the monks of Bridlington themselves, when they brought off Scottish raiders in 1322, the distinctly unauthorised negotiations of the Cumberland Knights Sir Andrew de Harkley in 1323, and those of Edward II himself shortly thereafter, 
Bruce is invariably described as King of Scotland. Clearly, for the Bridlington Chronicler, negotiations with Bruce implied the recognition of his kingship. More generally, he describes Edward II's conflict with Bruce straightforwardly as a war with the Scots, with no suggestion that there are anything but national enemies rather than rebels. It should be noted, however, that while it appears to have been derived from an earlier account written much closer to these events, the Bridlington Chronicle was not compiled until the end of Edward III's reign, by which time the Crown's insistence that the Scots should be classed as rebels had been quietly dropped, so it is possible we are dealing with a degree of hindsight. A more immediately contemporary example is furnished by Peter Langtoft, another Yorkshire Chronicle chronicler, writing probably at the end of Edward I's reign, or shortly thereafter. His work was imbued with a brilliant hatred for the Scots. Nevertheless, while he describes the Scots as dogs acting out of folly, he does not directly accuse them of rebellion. Rather, he records John Balliol, King of Scots, and his barons as having, quote, withdrawn their homage from King Edward, a phrase redolent of the formal letters of defiance issued by John Balliol in 1296. And this reflects an older view of lordship and kingship as a more negotiable and contingent relationship, which was increasingly at odds with developing theories of sovereignty adopted by Edward I and his successors. The closest Langtop comes to the accusation of rebellion is in describing John Balliol's decision to negotiate with King Philip of France as, quote, against his homage and against his faith, which is hardly consistent with Langtoff's own uncritical account of John's withdrawal of that homage. William Wallace's rising of 1297 is described not as a rebellion, but rather as a resumption of the war by a Scottish rebel. And Edward I's opponents are identified simply as Scots. Thus, Langtoff records how in the Parliament of 1299, quote, King Edward sought the aid of his men with which to rally his host against the stinking Scot. When he comes to Robert Bruce's seizure of the Scottish kingship in 1306, however, Langtoff, or possibly by this time a continuator, is rather more circumspect. The campaigns are, in fact, represented as a war against Bruce personally, reflecting the distinction made by the Crown. Thus, Edward, Prince of Wales, is described as setting out, quote, to search for King Robin, wherever he might be found. Walter Gisborough was another Northern chronicler and contemporary of Peter Langtoft, who also wrote his chronicle in the early 14th century. <coughs> Significantly, he took up Edward the First language, characterising the outbreak of the rising of 1297 thus, quote, the perfidious nation of the Scots began to rebel. Gisborough even applied this retrospectively, describing the outbreak of war in 1296 in the following terms. The Scots, in the manner of restless, capricious and unreliable men, began to rebel against the King of the English. Although Edward himself had not then, at that point, adopted such a terminology. Nevertheless, thereafter, Gisborough presents a conflict straightforwardly as not a rebellion, but a war with the Scots. Moving to Edward II's reign, the anonymous author of the Vita Edwardi Secundi appears to have been a well-informed royal clerk. His chronicle was compiled over the course of the reign, though before the end of it, thus providing a barometer of changing English opinion. He assiduously avoids referring to Robert Bruce as king, having related how he put the crown on himself, quote, against his king and lord to whom he had sworn fealty. However, he refers to Bruce's supporters simply as the Scots. Even though much of the chronicle was composed before 1313, at which time a significant number of Scots still remained in uh, the allegiance of Edward II. Thus, <laughs> in an aside written in that year, commenting on Edward's increasingly apparent failings, the author wrote that, quote, if he had followed the advice of the barons, he would have humbled the Scots with ease. Particularly revealing is a passage where, in his account of Andrew Hartley's treason in 1323, the author reports Edward denouncing English rebels. Small wonder if the Scots, who are in no way bound to me, invade my kingdom 
when those who are bound to me by fealty and homage rise against me. Now this speech was doubtless that, that invented by the author, but at any rate, it directly contra contradicts the English Crown's policy at that time. It is also somewhat at odds with the author's own account of Bruce's seizure of the Scottish kingship. This, however, had been written a decade earlier, and presumably this later comment reflects changing attitudes in England, as some, at least, of the English political community came to accept, how the grudgingly, Scotland's de facto sovereignty. Here, Bruce's spectacular victory at Bannockburn may have been something of a turning point. Thus, the author of the Lanacost so-called chronicle commented, indeed, after the aforesaid victory, Robert Bruce was generally called King of Scotland by everybody because he had acquired Scotland by force of, and arms. Such judgments would have been reinforced by the commonplace orthodoxy that victory in battle was a sign of divine judgment, marking out the cause of the victor as just. From 1332, Edward Balliol's inauguration as King of Scots provided the English crown with a good reason to discount David Bruce's kingship. <coughs> and this is reflected in the continuation of the Brute Chronicle, compo composed soon after 1333, by someone with close links with the disinherited followers of Balliol. Its author consistently refers to Balliol as the King of Scotland, or as King Edward of Scotland. Nevertheless, he describes Edward III's campaign, which ended with a triumphant victory at Allerdon Hill, which forms the climax of the Chronicle, not as an English intervention to help the King of Scotland to defeat rebels, but rather in terms of a war between the English and the Scots. An alternative and perhaps more immediate perspective on the opinions of the English political class, classes is provided by petitions to the Crown. These were carefully drafted, often by men of law acting on their client's behalf, to maximise the chances of eliciting a favourable response for the petitioner. They therefore tended to reflect the language of royal communications, using the Crown's own justifications to justify the petitioner's request. As such, they provide a particularly revealing picture of the reach and influence of these justifications, and they tend to confirm the picture present, represented by chroniclers. When petitioning on Scottish affairs, petitioners were careful to avoid according royal titles to the Bruces, as when a petition of circa 1313 from the Dean and Chapter of Salisbury Cathedral referred to, quote, the great damages and hurts that Robert de Bruce and his allies inflicted in the realm of England. By contrast, however, petitioners did not generally refer to the Scots as rebels. Another petition of circa 1313 came from one David de Bretoyne, who described himself as a knight of Scotland, <coughs> who was requesting Edward II for a grant of lands in Lincolnshire, on the grounds that he had lost all his lands in Scotland because he would not become the man of Sir Robert de Bruce. But he describes Bruce not as a rebel, but simply as the king's enemy. And this is particularly significant because, as a Scot in Edward's allegiance, Bertoyne might be expected to have been particularly receptive to the portrayal of Bruce as a rebel. Equally revealing is Petition 1302, from uh, William de La Salle and his wife concerning lands in Yorkshire, held of them by Philip the Scot and his wife, which had escheated to the king. The petition states that the Scot, a surname which is evidently descriptive indicating Scottish uh, nationality, and his wife were killed in Scotland as, quote, enemies of the king. Nevertheless, despite the fact that the Scots' lands have been forfeited because of their actions, the cells still did not see fit to describe them as rebels. In response to this petition, an inquisition was ordered, and it is revealing that the privy seal writ warranting this inquisition changed the wording describing the Scot and his wife as having been killed while, quote, against the king's faith, bringing it into line with the royal policy by framing them as rebels against the king, rather than merely his enemies. Perhaps most revealing, though, are the numerous petitions from the Anglo-Scottish marches, begging for relief from taxation or for relief from poverty 
due to the impact of Scottish invasion and raiding. Despite the fact that these were directly concerned, uh, that, that these directly concerned depredations inflicted by the Scots in open war against the king, these almost invariably refer simply to the Scottish enemies and do not describe them as enemies, as, as rebels. Thus, in 1318, Samson de Mousen petitioned the king and his council for relief from rents owed to the Crown Lordship of Bamburgh Castle and to the Sheriff of Northumberland because his, his manor of Mousen was entirely destroyed and uninhabited due to the great destructions, arsons and robberies committed by the Scottish enemies. The king and council looked favourably on the crest and sent writs ordering the constable of Bamburgh and the sheriff to pardon the rent, explaining that Samson was unable to pay due to the robberies and arsons committed by the Scots. Again, however, the wording was amended in the writ so that the Scots were now described as rebels. Strikingly, Scots across the border who remained in the English allegiance similarly failed to refer to Scottish opponents of the English as rebels, even though they might be supposed to have had a direct interest in playing to this line, as it would serve to highlight their own continued, and therefore deserving, loyalty. First, a petition of 1313 to Edward II from, quote, his men of Scotland, referred simply to the king's, quote, enemies. These are entirely typical cases of petitioners failing to take up the Crown's line, even though it was clearly in their direct interest to fall in line with it. While the Crown nevertheless continued to pursue this line in the face of all the evidence that it was simply not cutting through to its intended recipients. All of this suggests that the Crown had little success in getting its agenda across. As we have seen, one of the primary vehicles for disseminating its views and attempting to legitimise and build support for all policy were the writs issued to its ministers, officials and subjects across the realm. But on a practical level, much of this labour intensive industry may have been somewhat wasted. To take just one example, consider the writ sent to John Byron, Sheriff of York, in 1297 in the aftermath of the disastrous English defeat at Stirling Bridge. He had previously been ordered to select and retain men of the county, Yorkshire, to go to London with horses and arms on business that was left studiously unspecified at a time of increasing uh, political tension. He was now, however, enjoying uh, an order to, quote, enjoin them firmly to go to Scotland, to join Earl Warren, quote, for the repressing of the Scots, our rebels and enemies, with the help of God. John would probably have delegated to a clerk the task of informing the selected re recruits that they were now going to Scotland instead of London. And we may perhaps wonder whether the clerk would actually have bothered to expound to them the detail that the Scots should be considered as rebels, particularly given that the writ was written in Latin, whereas the clerk would presumably have passed on the orders in French or English. Of course, there were other means of communicating the Crown's line than writs and proclamations. Edward I certainly intended the executions for rebellion of William Wallace in 1305 and of Robert Bruce's adherents in 1306-7 to send out a message. They were indeed widely reported and did have some effect in influencing perceptions of the Scots as rebels. The author of a verse celebrating these uh, executions, written in English and so presumably aimed at a popular audience, referred to, quote, the traitors of Scotland and described Sir Simon Fraser, a former knight of Redwood's household, as, quote, traitor and fickle. Subsequently, the poem deserve, uh, describes how Fraser was drawn to, Norgate, to, to Newgate, quote, so that he should be known by those of both high and of low estate as a traitor. Paradoxically, however, the very severity of the measures may have served to confuse the issue, thus undermining their intended message. Such harsh punishments for rebellion were unprecedented, and the English conflicts of the, 12, of the 1260s had not seen the execution of captured rebels by the Crown. And so the Lambercost chronicler, commenting on the executions of Scots in 1306, exclaimed with surprise that among those hanged were not only simple laymen and pe peasants, but also knights and clerics and prebendaries 
And in fact, the only previous execution to rebellion in Edward's reign had been of the Welshmen, Dafydd ap Ap Griffith and Rhys Ap Meredith. This can only have served to differentiate Scots and Welshmen as a separate category from English rebels. And this can be seen in different reactions to their treatment. While the execution of Scots and Welshmen was seen as entirely appropriate and thoroughly deserved, the subsequent execution of Englishmen for rebellion during Edward II's reign was widely condemned as tyrannical, with the Lanacost chronicler denouncing, quote, the excessive cruelty of the king and his men. It thus seems likely that the execution of Scots and Welshmen was widely approved not because they were regarded as rebels, but precisely because they were Scots and Welshmen, and so out with the political community. Conversely, during Edward II's reign, when the execution of English rebels became much more common, no Scots were executed as rebels, albeit this was due to sheer force of circumstance rather than any change in the Crown policy. With the resumption of Anglo-Scottish War in 1333, however, while the Crown continued to refer to their Scottish opponents as rebels, captured Scots were not executed as rebels. Rather, they were generally ransomed, and so were treated as though they were legitimate combatants captured in war. Overall then, the treatment of Scots captured in arms against the English Crown was markedly different from that of Englishmen. And this cannot have helped the Crown's efforts to frame the Scots as the rebels. More broadly, the mo most persuasive political communication is that which aims to convince people of what they are already inclined to believe. Unlike the Welsh, the Scots, or at least the Lowland Scots, if not the Gaelic speaking Highland Scots, were considered to be part of the Francophile cultural mainstream of the Western Christendom. Lowland Scots spoke what they identified themselves as English. And until 1296, the Scots had close links with the English political society. Alexander II had married Henry III's sister. Many Scottish and English magnates had held estates in both England and Scotland, including the Balliols and the Bruces. And indeed, a Scottish contingent had fought alongside the future Edward I at the Battle of Lewes in 1264. Yet, <coughs> notwithstanding these links, and the long-standing claims of the Kings of England to the old lordship of Scotland, the Scots were seen by contemporaries very much as a separate people. There had been Kings of Scotland for a very long time, and the English were used to thinking of Scotland as a kingdom, claims of overlordship again notwithstanding. Even when Edward I abolished the Scottish kingship, he ruled Scotland as a land separate from England. And Scots who remained in the English allegiance remained apart from the English political community. They did not, for instance, attend Parliament. This sense of a Scottish nation underpinned English perceptions of the war. It is evident from Walter Gisborough's account of the rising of 1297, which begins, the perfidious nation, Gens, of the Scots, began to rebel. The sense of a separate Scottish nation underlay, and was in fact in turn amplified by the wave of xenophobic hatred of the Scots which followed the outbreak of war in 1296. This xenophobia was undoubtedly stoked by lurid atrocity stories, such as the claim that the Scots had burned alive 200 schoolboys at Exxon. These stories appear to have been deliberately circulated by Edward I in 1296 as an additional post facto justification for war. As well as featuring prominently in his letter to Boniface VIII in 1301, they were repeated in a number of contemporary English chronicles, including the Landacost Chronicle, William of Gisborough, Peter de Lancotoft, and the Very St. Evans Chronicle. However, the Crown's propagation of such tales may inadvertently have helped to undermine its own line that the Scots should be regarded as rebels. Under the laws of war, the deliberate burning of property was a sign of open or public war. And under the laws of war, open or public war could only be legally conducted by a sovereign prince. Of course, the English crown denied that John Balliol or Robert and David Bruce were sovereign princes. Nevertheless, when the Bruces led armies into England, which burned and ravaged, they were conducting war in the manner of sovereign princes. <coughs> 
Such perceptions may have been strengthened in Northern England by the necessity of buying off these invading Scottish armies. This frequently involved the sealing of formal truces, which obliged the leaders of local communities to use Bruce's royal title. An example is provided by the indenture between, quote, the noble Prince Sir Robert, by the grace of God, King of Scotland, and the people of the community of the Bishop of Durham between Tyne and Tees in 1312. Here, a contrast may be drawn with the internal conflicts in England during the reigns of Henry III and Edward II. Pillaging and ravaging, another sign of open or public war, were undoubtedly routine in these conflicts. Deliberate burning, however, appears to have been rather less common. And of course, these conflicts were of much shorter duration. These internal conflicts were characterised by the English Crown's rebellions, but they were qualitatively different from the wars fought against the Scots. Furthermore, Edward II adopted a deliberate policy that conflicts against generals in England should not be classed as war, as a means of denying the right of his opponents to bear arms against him. Yet he continued to refer to, quote, our war in Scotland. And of course, the Scottish wars were fought across the border, which had been fixed long before it had been formally recognised by the English Crown in 1237, and which remained fixed, irrespective of the, of the direct English lordship that was imposed over large parts of Scotland for much of this period. In fact, the Crown's own messaging served to reinforce the perception of the Scots as a national enemy. Edward I, writ of 24th June 1297, referred carefully to, quote, certain rebels, manufacturers, and disturbers of our peace. But the Crown soon became less discriminating, referring to, quote, the Scots, our rebels and enemies, in the close roll writ of April 1306, or to the malice and perfidy of the Scots, our enemies and rebels. Such labels served to characterise all Scots as enemies of the Crown, failing to differentiate them from the many Scots who remained in the English legions, until 1314 at least. And of course it was hardly appropriate after 1332, when the English had recognised Edward Balliol as King of Scots, and particularly after 1334, when large parts of southern England had been ceded to English rule. <coughs> the Crown did make some allowance for this after 1306, when Robert Bruce's killing of John Comyn alienated a large part of the Scottish political establishment, who remained bitterly opposed to Bruce's kingship. Thereafter, some Crown writs referred to the malice and rebellion of Robert Bruce and his accomplices, or such like, and which occasionally continued to specify Robert Bruce and his accomplices through the period up to the peace of 1328, differentiating between Bruce's supporters and the Scots as a people, though with little consistency. However, this seems to have had little impact in changing overall perceptions. These perceptions were shaped even by the Crown's own diplomats. So these perceptions were shared even by the Crown's own diplomats. In January 1321, Thomas Cobham, Bishop of Worcester, was appointed to a commission negotiating for a truce with Robert Bruce. In May, when Edward II's English opponents had attacked the Welsh lands of Hugh the Spencer, the younger, Cobham wrote to the Pope and Cardinals, lamenting that, where we seek peace, behold disorder, and while we take care to purge the boundaries of the realm, that worst plague, familial hostility, and the makings of internal war stealthily crawls in at the centre. As a Crown diplomat, Bishop Cobham would have been very aware of the official line. Yet here, he was drawing an implicit but clear distinction between war internal to England and the international war being fought between England and Scotland. For the English political community, there was a tension between the idea of rebels as being the enemies of the king who were internal to his realm and their long-standing and internalised perception of Scotland as a separate realm, a perception that some 40 years of Crown messaging failed to undermine. It was not so difficult to convince the English political com community of the illegitimacy of the kingships of John Balliol and Robert and David uh, Bruce, given Balliol's deposition 
Robert Bruce's seizure of the kingship following a, a sacrilegious, sacrilegious murder, and the existence of an English backed alternative to David. Even so, the successful exercise of kingship by Robert Bruce and the success of David Bruce's followers served to undermine this message. On a more fundamental level, however, while the English could not be persuaded to regard the Scots as rebels and continued to view Scotland as a separate nation, yet they fully endorsed the Crown's claim to the overlordship of Scotland. English historical tradition held that the kings of England were the rightful overlords of Scotland as the heirs of Arthur, king of the Britons, a claim which could be dated right back to the first arrival of the Trojan Brutus in the land of Britain, a tradition which Edward I and his successors made full use of. In this long-term view, legal niceties over the precise status of the Scots as either internal rebels or national enemies were of no great concern to the wider political community of England. Either way, they were generally, if somewhat, sometimes somewhat reluctantly, prepared to fund and fight campaigns to pursue, enforce and maintain the God-given rights of their kings. And this was particularly so given that the Scottish invasion was a constant threat to Northern England after 1296. So, perhaps, in the end, the Crown's failure to propagate its agenda on rebellion did not really matter. And if you want a moral to all of this, then perhaps it just goes to show that English confusion and double think over national sovereignty is nothing new. Thank you very much.